Terrible quests in otherwise great games are fairly common, but I would argue that The Witcher 3 does an excellent job of having very few. The bad ones are the extreme exception among nearly 400 total quests. That said, I decided to finally put together a video I've been planning on since I started the channel, one I'm very surprised hasn't been done before, where we take on the absolute bottom of the barrel, the worst The Witcher 3 has to offer. And make no mistake, there is a bottom to the barrel. My five entries to this list sprung to mind immediately, but beyond those five, I couldn't think of any others worthy of a spot here. Now that may lead you to wonder, why is seven in the title then? Well, after I'd come up with my five, I wanted to double check to make sure I wasn't missing an obvious one, and I found that the wider community absolutely despises two quests that I actually will defend a bit. But I wanted to include them in this video because both were overwhelmingly mentioned for worst in the game, one of which really, really surprised me. Anyway, this was a surprisingly fun video to make, one of my favorites, and if it goes over well and you guys like it, I may do a 10 best quests video as well, which would be a real challenge for me for obvious reasons. So like I said, 6 and 7 are not my picks, and I have them here partially because I want to read the comment section and get an idea of what you guys think. After I'd put together my 5, I looked at other opinions, and I found that these two quests were the second and third most mentioned for the title of absolute worst in the game. The first most mentioned was already on my list, so I didn't need to add anything there. Anyway, first up we have Broken Flowers. This is the quest fairly early in Novigrad, where Geralt and Zoltan have to figure out what happened to Dandelion by speaking to a variety of women he scorned in one way or another. You do realize Dandelion doesn't have a sister? Sure he does. Saw him himself. Funny, she don't look like him at all. Blonde, for starters. Maybe they have different fathers. Mm-hmm. Different mothers, too. Maybe. This journey eventually leads you to Priscilla and one of the game's most memorable moments. I will say, I understand why people don't like this quest, I just don't really agree. Granted, it does go on for a long time, with very little combat to break it up, and it's extremely dialogue-heavy, which I understand isn't for everyone. The game also doesn't do a very good job of making it obvious that you don't have to speak to the entire list you're given. The Taylor Ellie Hall and the school teacher are both completely optional, so you can easily reduce the length of this quest dramatically if you're finding it tedious. The game just doesn't tell you that. Overall though, the reason I would go out of my way to defend Broken Flowers is because I think it does a solid job of introducing the premise of Dandelion and his relationship with Geralt. The Witcher 3 was the introduction to the series for the majority of players, and what this quest does is provide a nice spin on what longtime fans might be expecting from Dandelion, while also giving newcomers a classic, what has he gotten himself into series of events. When I say there's a nice spin, I just mean that the quest starts out with you thinking it's the same old, same old with him. But as you progress and eventually meet Priscilla, you realize that things have changed in the time between Witcher 2 and 3. I don't personally mind this quest, it's not necessarily a favorite of mine, but I felt like it needed a mention based on the sheer volume of fans saying they thought it was the worst overall. The second community pick, and this one did hurt to include because it is a favorite of mine, is Wandering in the Dark, aka the Kira Metz main quest. Gavella Glan. Not only was this one of the top responses for number one most hated quest, I found tons of posts on places like Reddit and other forums just dedicated to the overwhelming hatred of Wandering in the Dark. It also apparently made YouTube commenter Hot Single Horses burst into tears, which is quite sad. I'm gonna breeze past this entry to get to the beginning of my list, but to be honest, the Kira Metz questline is one of my favorites in the entire game, and I have no problem with Wandering in the Dark. I think the atmosphere is excellent, the Wild Hunt boss fight is solid, and most importantly, the banter between Geralt and Kira is perfect. I can't believe you'd think so poorly of me. Perhaps you do bear a grudge against sorceresses. Mm-hmm. Can't imagine where that comes from. So let's get to my list and the five Witcher 3 quests I think are outright bad. Now I want to immediately acknowledge that number five is by far the most mild offender for me. The crimes of this quest are far lower than what we'll get to. That said, I had to include Bitter Harvest. This is a very small side quest where you protect a group of scavengers from several waves of necrophages. It can be found in a battlefield near the border post, aka the little bridge in camp where you need a special pass to enter Redania and head to Novigrad. It's a quest you'll likely find very early in one of two ways. You can stumble upon it, it's in the immediate vicinity of where you first spawn in Velen, or you can speak to a merchant near the border post bridge. He'll offer you a heavy discount on a pass to Redania if you help his brother-in-law Albert, who just so happens to be the lead scavenger. 
So why does this quest suck? Well, for one, the guy you need to keep alive, Albert, dies in one hit no matter the difficulty, even on story mode. He's the foreman who will pay you for helping his group when the quest is over. And more importantly, you can't get the pass discount from his brother-in-law if he gets hit a single time. He also just so happens to be the only one of the scavengers that directly follows you around while you fight the waves of enemies. One rogue swipe from any of them, and Albert dies, and then you better reload if you want full payment or the pass discount. Because believe it or not, the merchant isn't very happy with you if his brother-in-law joins the corpses on the battlefield. He... Uh, was killed. What? You pulling me leg? Forget my offer. It's off the table, you git. Of course, if you're overleveled or on New Game Plus knowing exactly what to do, then keeping him alive is significantly less annoying. But the other reason this quest was included here is because most of Bitter Harvest just consists of standing around. After each wave of enemies, you have to just wait and do nothing for about two minutes real time before the next wave will slowly start trickling in. I remember on both my first and second playthrough thinking the quest had bugged out because none of the characters say anything, your objective also doesn't update, and there are no new enemies in sight for minutes at a time. Then right when you're about to give up and reload, the next wave will start trickling in. Bitter Harvest takes about 8-10 to 10 minutes in total, and 5 of those consist of doing absolutely nothing. Number 4 on my list is a quest no one talks about despite it being one of the longest in the entire game, and that is Wine Wars from the Blood and Wine DLC. Now I'm going to ignore the fact that this is an incredibly bug ridden quest, and instead focus on the actual content of it when it does work. The foundation of Wine Wars is awesome. You come across these two bickering vineyard owners, Liam and Matilda, and both want your help clearing out 5 problems each at their vineyards. It's also immediately apparent that despite the bickering, the two of them don't quite hate each other the way they pretend to. Pretty face is hardly enough if the head it adorns is empty. Says the most foppish philandra of the southern reaches. You do better to tend to your vineyard and look less to the grape stomping lasses. Every cutscene with these two is great. They each suspect the other has been the one sabotaging their respective vineyard, causing the problems that you need to take care of, but it's pretty clear from the beginning that something else is going on, which had the potential to be interesting. The problem though is that their cutscenes make up maybe 5 to 10% of this nearly 2 hour long side quest. The rest of those 120 minutes consist of you running around doing the same three things over and over and over again across the entire Blood and Wine map. 50% of this quest is just travel, running on foot or riding roach to the next objective again and again, and 6 of the 10 issues you need to take care of are just clearing out the same enemy many times over, the Archospores. Plus there's a bonus 11th objective you end up doing that's also infested with the same exact enemy. Unfortunately, there's no interesting mystery you slowly unravel either. Half of the objectives have absolutely nothing going on, not even a note. You just clear out a couple of enemies after running for 5 minutes and then move on, total busy work. The mystery boils down to you discovering on one path that there's a third party saboteur, which was already obvious, and on the other you're led to confirmation that the sabotage was done by a guy named Count Crespi, who's already dead so it hardly matters. The Knights Deadloft killed. What exactly did they do to you? Crespi, Dulac, Lacroix, Peyrec Perrin? Knights are not so chivalrous when no one's watching. What makes it worse, and I had actually forgotten this about Wine Wars before making the video because I did go back and play each of these to confirm my picks, was that after you complete the 11 objectives for the vineyard owners and think it's finally over, the game hits you with another 5 objectives of essentially the exact same thing all over again. More work for me, I guess. It's just 5 more additional repetitive tasks spread across the entire map before you're finally done for good. Like I said, the characters of this quest are great, but there are dozens of Witcher contracts I can think of that pack a way more interesting story into quests with far better pacing. Overall, The Witcher 3 is maybe the most impressive game I've ever played when it comes to disguising busy work. It's usually done in such a fun or engaging way that you don't even notice, but Wine Wars, in my opinion, is one of the rare occasions where that concept was spread way too thin. To move on, I'm now going to pick on a very small side quest in Skellige. It's called For Fame and Glory, and is an unmarked quest where you come across two Skelligan warriors hanging out near a cave entrance. If you get too close, a forced cutscene will play where the two of them fill you in on their master plan. We'll kill them all! This quest is just kinda busted on every level, which is why it immediately sprung to my mind for this video. If you tell the two of them that you'll help, they'll rush into the cave and almost immediately die before you can do anything. 
The best chance you have to prevent this is to axie both of them so they don't follow you at first, and then be leveled up enough where you can sprint ahead and kill everything before they catch up, because they're that fragile. The bigger issue though is that if either of the two warriors get swiped, the entire quest fails. If one survives and you clear the cave, you can't talk to the other guy at all, and you're just forced to reload unless you want to be stuck with the failed quest. For our runner-up, I'm gonna cheat a little bit here because this is part of a quest and not the entire thing, but my pick is the first 75% of the Isle of Mists, aka when you finally set off to reunite with Ciri. Now the very end of this quest is perfect. That conversation with Ciri is one of the game's best moments. However, just about everything that comes before that is maybe my least favorite section of the entire main story. You get to this tiny island where you know Ciri is and speak to four dwarves behind a locked door. It's immediately apparent that they know something and she may even be in this small little building. Now Geralt doesn't blow the door down for one reason or another and the game decides now is a good time to send you on a fetch quest all across the Isle of Mists, your goal being to find the rest of the seven dwarves. Well actually there's eight, there's a bonus dwarf you can find in a little hidden cave, but that's beside the point. The fetch quest for the other dwarves wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for this absolute buffoon named Gaspard. He's the narcoleptic dwarf in the lighthouse, and if you thought Horson Jr. was a bad dude, he's nothing compared to this clown. You're then forced to slowly trudge back across the island, leading this irritating little tuna can as he falls asleep every 10 seconds. Wake up. Uh, I'm awake. Wait, wait a week. It drives me nuts every single time I cannot stand this guy, and I will continue my hate campaign for this imbecile Gaspard for as long as the channel survives. That is my promise to you. Before I get to my number one, I do want to throw out a few quests that crossed my mind for this list, but I revisited and decided against. The first is In Wolf's Clothing, or the Morkvarg quest. This quest is flawed, definitely a little buggy, and the garden can be a little annoying to navigate, but I realized in replaying this one that it has a lot of great things going for it, and most of what I don't like about it comes down to having to listen to Morkvarg moan for five minutes at a time. Wish to hear a story? If I have to, I'm all ears. <laughs> Your story have a point, we're just doing some chest pounding. I also love how you can lift Morkvarg's curse, take his reward, and then kill him to double up on payment from the priestesses as well. For that reason alone, I couldn't include it on this list. I also considered the horse races, mostly because they aren't even really races. They're just, can you block your opponent when you run out of stamina simulators? But that's really all there is to say, and if it weren't for those quests, the Witcher community never would have been given the Kuka gift that Kuka keeps on giving, stuttering Matko. Yeah, 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 you'll s s say, I I I I'll b b b b b b ah. Fuck it. Aside from that, there really were no other quests I even considered, because 99% of the time even the smallest Witcher 3 side quest is at least solid. If there's one you thought I missed or personally don't like, I'd like to hear about it. That aside though, my number one choice is probably obvious. It's the most hated quest in the Witcher community, it's my least favorite quest by Miles and Miles, and it's Reason of State, or the quest where you take down Radovid. Overall, Reason of State is just the prime example of how running out of dev time affected the quality of certain things in the game's final act. It's not worth breaking down beat by beat here, I have an entire video on Reason of State, but ultimately the ending of this quest would get my vote for the worst moment in the trilogy. Reason of State is often referred to as the assassination quest because of what you do to Radovid, but I would suggest that calling it the assassination quest should instead refer to what the ending does to Dijkstra's character. Reason of State had the very unfortunate task of needing to wrap up an extremely shaky political storyline. And when I say shaky, I mean that it's one part of the game that if you think about beyond the surface, a lot of cracks begin to appear. Several major kingdoms and important characters are unaccounted for or glossed over. Almost every plot point from Witcher 2 is completely forgotten. And maybe most importantly, a ton of Nilfgaard related war content was scrapped because the devs just ran out of time. This put the ending to the Northern War storyline in a tough spot. And what we ended up with was a hasty assassination, awkwardly squeezed just before the final battle, and an ending that tries to quickly tie things up at the expense of one of the smartest characters in the series. 
Dijkstra's intelligence throughout the books and Witcher 3 is supposed to feel almost superhuman, even though it isn't. Physically, he's just a tall, fat guy, completely mortal, yet his mind runs laps around book and game characters that are hundreds of years old. That is, until the very end of Reason of State, when his IQ plummets below room temp, and he makes a decision that no amount of mental gymnastics can ever explain away. He decides it's a good idea to show up in person while Geralt is still there to reveal his master betrayal of Vess, Roach, and Toller, and his intent to kill all of them. For some reason, he only brings a few of his regular goons to do the job, and somehow expects Geralt to just step aside and let them all die. I really can't stress how little sense this makes for multiple reasons. One, Dijkstra would not show up in person for something like this. Dijkstra is not a soldier, and he knows it. He's a middle-aged, overweight spy with a still-crippled ankle courtesy of Book Geralt. Second, there is no logic to Dijkstra not waiting for Geralt to be out of the way. If he'd simply held off for about five minutes, Geralt would have removed himself from the situation on his own. Then Dijkstra's men would just have to deal with two soldiers and a bald guy wearing a monocle instead of a witcher. Third, if we ignore 1 and 2, the fact that Dijkstra somehow thinks Geralt would just allow the slaughter of his friends is ridiculous. It just is. That's the least Geralt thing ever. Every step of his story consists of him prioritizing his friends far beyond politics or the greater good, and Dijkstra knows that. He knows more about Geralt than half of his friends do. Even if you did the Yorvith path in Witcher 2 and had limited exposure to Roach and Vess, Geralt is still not stepping aside to let the two of them and Toller be slaughtered. It just would not happen. The only in-character Dijkstra moment during this entire quest happens after he's dead, when you find out he had a chicken sandwich in his pocket the entire time. Well, that does it for today's video. If you enjoyed, consider leaving a like, as that really helps these videos find an audience. And also, I just wanted to say that I'm still working hard on my What Would Geralt Do Witcher 3 project. It's written, recorded, and now it just needs to be edited. I can't wait to get it uploaded, and it should be popping up in your sub box sometime relatively soon.